the second of our architectural design lectures, really the introduction to it. In this one here, we're going to have a look at um, a very simple example uh, of, of how we can put together pretty much the, the first steps of our, our design. So we're going to base it on Space Invaders. It's a simple game, it's a classic game, um, probably one that most people are familiar with. And here we have a, a screenshot of a particular implementation of Space Invaders. And I'm imagining here that uh, almost the, the situation you'd be in is that you, you have in your head an idea of the type of game that you want to develop, or you can sketch it down or draw a few sketches in a piece of paper. But given that, the next step then is to try to identify the objects that you have within that. So based on this, the types of things we could identify, well, we have some background decorative effects. Uh, maybe we'll have a mountain range and a, a scrolling uh, sky behind that. We've got some game objects. So there we've identified the base, we've identified the player ship, we've identified the missiles, the actual space invaders themselves, and the mothership that occasionally appears at the top. Alongside that, we can also identify overlay information in terms of the number of lives, in terms of the particular score that the player has. And if we wanted to, we could also say we imagine we'll have some decorative effects, things like explosions and whatnot within it. And you could carry on. I mean, you could mention sounds will be playing, but we're going to largely ignore those. So in terms of this uh, simple illustrative design, there are the broad things that we're going to to select from the idea that we have in our head of how we want to implement Space Invaders. Now, the, the aside is quite important here that Space Invaders is a well-known game. It's quite a simple game. Um, it's one that is um, probably quite easily definable. It was relatively straightforward to go through and to look at a screenshot and to pick a few things out. For the games that you are creating, you probably won't have a, well, you may have a screenshot of some similar one there, but um, it's going to be very much more iterative. Things will change over time. You probably won't get it 100% right the first time, but that's perfectly fine. If you're getting it 70% right, that's good. You're 70% of the way there. Um, so the example design we're showing here is not how it will happen in the real world. You will iterate, you will get some things down, some things will stand the test of time, other things will be modified or, or simply drop out. That's perfectly okay. So, given the objects that we've identified uh, on the last screen, what I would suggest we would want to do then is to go through the objects and to, to, to think of the ones that are going to be essential, get a list of them, uh, the ones that are going to be optional. Uh, so core objects in this, things like the player ship, the enemy ships, uh, the mothership, the player missile, the enemy missile, and the base. Now, for each and all of those things, you would then be asking, okay, for the player ship, what properties define it? So it'll have a certain graphic, it'll have a certain position, and that's maybe the only properties that really need to define it. What does it do in terms of the update? Well, we would be thinking, okay, it's going to check for user input, it's going to move every once in a while, depending on user input, and maybe we'll create a player missile. So whereas they are sitting defining uh, its behavior. How do we draw it out? Now, depending on what we have in mind, we might just simply say, well, just draw that image. In other cases, we might say, actually, we want to have an animated image or something like that. But in all cases, we've identified an object, and we're going through the steps of saying what that object does and what data does it need to encapsulate. You can see here that some decisions already have been made. So for example, the player missile and the enemy missile, we have have separate objects for those. Now, there's nothing right or nothing wrong with this. Designs are arbitrary constructs. Um, I may well on the previous side have decided we will have missiles and the player and enemies will use exactly the same type of missile. It just so happened from the screenshot that they ended up with different ones. Um, but we're engaging that process of adding a bit of structure to it. Um, and you would do the same process for all of them. Go through these, work out, okay, what it should be, what it should not be. Um, so for example, the base at the bottom, um, if actually if I go back um, a couple of slides. So you can see down here for this one at the base at the bottom, um, 
it gets eroded over time whenever it gets hit by the opponent. So almost the base of the bottom, we're saying there's two parts to it, that we have a graphic showing the city and a graphic showing the, the scale that can, or the shield that can change. Now, that may be elements that we want to embed within the, um, the, the base object. It may entail we end up having two separate objects. We have a city and we have a shield as a different object. But they're all, they're all examples of how this can evolve and how it can change. Uh, temporal objects, so alongside that we might say we have explosions, uh, overlay objects, things like the lifes or the score that gets to be displayed. And you, you would come up with a similar list of, of objects that you believe you'll have within your game. And as mentioned, go through, have an initial thought about what they should do, the properties they should have. Uh, decorative objects, okay, the background and the, uh, the scrolling um, sky. For hierarchies then, so once we have identified the objects that we think are reasonable to have in our game, it's useful then to think about, well, how are we going to group them together? Now this can be within containers and data structures. It can also be in terms of inheritance. So we've got a, a few sort of hierarchical views um, here. Lots of different ways of doing this, no right, no wrong. So here's just a, a couple of examples. Um, I'm pretty certain you'll come up with different ones if you're doing yourself. So we might say that uh, bottom of the thing here, you can see all the different objects from the missile, the alien ship, the mothership, the player ship, alien missile, the player missile, and we've, we've grouped these things. Uh, so we're saying that alien missile and player missile are both types of missile, which is a type of sprite. So that assumes, one I supposes, that sprite is any type of moving object, and a missile is one type of moving object, of which we say there are two different types. An AI-controlled sprite is a type of moving sprite, <coughs> but presumably one where we will have some hooks for adding AI into it, and the player ship, again, we're just saying this type of sprite. So it's, it's one way of grouping them, of giving them structure, um, of saying, okay, there are certain things that we think are in common and we can inherit. Uh, another example, overlay objects. We might declare an overlay object class and say there's going to be life and score. And Depending on if you have a timer, we could add that in. We could say then that's a third type of overlay object. Temporal events, we could say explosions and maybe splash messages. Um, different things that come into it. Again, it'll be an iterative process. Your architecture, your classes will probably change over time. Often, unless initially there's a clear need for putting in a superclass, and you know, it's clear that there'll be some superclass here we can inherit things from. Often, it's a useful idea to design the class and then whenever you see that there are things that are uh, potentially uh, shareable between them and it makes sense to relate these things to inheritance then to refactor it so you do tease out the base class from both of them. So other than um, looking at the inheritance hierarchies, it's useful to think about how will we group these things together and what type of containers. Uh, Space Invaders, there's nothing particularly interesting by way of how you might want to do this. Uh, so we might say that we've got an invaders layer. Uh, this was the implication then we're saying we could have a main menu layer as well, but this is our screen within which we play it. It's going to contain a number of things. It'll contain one off the background, the lifes, and the score. So there we're assuming these are just objects that are part of, they are composite, they belong to the invaders layer, but there's not a collection of them. We could also assume we have a dynamic array of bases of alien ships and of alien missiles. Now, again, this is where decisions come in. So the, the bases, you may only ever have three bases or four bases or whatever it is. So an array is perfectly fine doesn't even have to be a dynamic array. For the alien missiles and the alien ships, they will change over time. You'll, you'll start off with um, a certain number of alien ships that will then presumably decrease. For your missiles, depending on how you spawn them, you could have between a minimum zero to maximum some number. Um, assumption here has been just use an array of them. And I say in the text, okay, we could use a dynamic array as they're not added or removed every frame. So the main thing that we want to think of for using data structures is the speed with which we need to access. How do we need to access? Is it sequential? Is it random? How frequently does the, the elements change? Now, you might be sitting thinking, hold on, 
the alien ships, they do change. You, you blow them up and they reduce. And that's true. But if you're running a game at 30 or 60 times a second, um, let's say that you kill one enemy per second, it means there'll be 59 frames where you're not removing anything and then one frame where you are removing it. It's also useful to look at the cost of adding and removing. Long and short, Space Invaders is too simple to make any difference one way or the other. But these are the types of things that are useful um, to, to consider. And zero or one of a mothership, a player ship, or a player missile. So these are things that we're saying um, are part of the invaders layer, but they're potentially nullable. We may not have one of these at a point in time. Obviously, the case of the mothership that sometimes is there, sometimes it's not there. Now, you may always have it. Uh, and for example, you could say sometimes it's on the screen and sometimes it's off the screen, but it always exists. So again, it's just different ways of making decisions based on this. Likewise with the player ship, we're assuming zero or one here because the thing can be exploded. But you could simply say the invaders there definitely will always contain a player ship, just sometimes you will choose not to draw it. So there are different ways of, of approaching this design. Updating drawings, the, the next element. So in this here, we would um, start thinking about, well, how would we update, or in this case, our invaders layer? And we could do exactly the same process for any of the objects. So invaders layer, we could say, first of all, when update is called, what we're gonna do, we're gonna update the background. Uh, update the background means we'd end up scrolling the background. Now, if you think about it, updating the background, it's kind of an independent thing that it just happens all of the time. Um, so there's no particular ordering to this. We could do it at the start of the update. We could do it at the end of the, we could do it in the middle, maybe a bit weird there, but wherever we want, we could put it in. We just need to make sure that we have managed to include it. Next, we're saying we want to update the player ship. Okay, that kind of makes sense then. Update the player ship. We need to get input, check to see if the player's provided any. Update the position if we're moving. Check to see if the player wants to fire something. Um, now, you could, at this point, sort of say, okay, well, the player could get hit by something. So I could check to see, has the player been hit? I haven't put that there because I've assumed, as an arbitrary assumption, that the collision detection will be done by the missiles um, as opposed to the things the missiles could hit. But it's just an arbitrary decision. Again, your design, you might decide to do it this way, and that's perfectly fine. Then update the player missile. So there we update the position, um, moving it up the screen, presumably. We check to see has it left the top of the screen, in which case we need to remove it. And we check and resolve any collisions. So we check to see has it hit the base, has it hit uh, an alien invader, has it hit the mothership. And we take some action uh, appropriate to whatever it has hit, if it does hit something. Update the mothership. So again, there we're checking to see if it exists, we're moving it across the screen. If it doesn't exist, we're maybe a random chance to check to see, does it appear? Update the alien ships. Uh, so we know they need to move either across or down the screen, depending on which phase of their movement they're in. And we would give each of them a chance of them to fire, to say, okay, have they, um, or, or do they want to fire? And again, if you were doing this in more detail, you'd be sitting asking, okay, well, they could get down to the bottom of the screen. They could potentially hit the player. Where are we going to embed that type of um, checking? Who's going to do that checking? Who's going to deal with the consequence? Update the alien missile. So there we're assuming that we update the position. We uh, move them down the screen, presumably. We check to see if they've collided with anything. So in this case, it's either going to be the base or the player. And if need be, we remove. So if they left the screen, if they've hit something. And again, a little bit more detail comes in. Most of the other steps would have this detail as well. So there we're sitting saying at the bottom that if it hits the player, then there's a set of further actions we would take in terms of removing a life from the player, triggering a respawn, or triggering game over, depending on the number of lives that there are. And you would have similar, um, when you iterate and get into more detail, you do similar things. So that for example, if a player missile hits the enemy, you want to remove it, but if it's the last one that exists, then you want to trigger next level and increase the score and whatever it is you want to do. Uh, final thing I have in the uh, invaders layer update is to simply increase the, the score depending on whether or not anything was hit. And again, that's an arbitrary assumption. 
um, because you might want to increase the score anytime there's a collision and only do it triggered from that particular point. For rendering it, um, in this case, it's just simply a matter of drawing things in the right order. Background first of all, then the bases, the ships and the missiles, we assume they're all at the same level. Uh, any explosions, we draw them on top of things. And finally, we draw up our, our scores, our lives, any messages that we have. So what we've done here is, is we're, we're basing it on the objects that we've teased out of our imagining as space invaders. And we've come up with um, some idea, it's not sufficiently detailed, but it, it's, it's a high level idea of how we can play Space Invaders, how the different objects, what they would do, what they need to communicate with. And the whole purpose of this is that we are taking a complex notion. Um, no, I'm going to pack mine in a second. We're taking a complex notion and we're breaking it up into more smaller, more manageable pieces. So, your turn, Pac-Man. Uh, you're going to do something similar, then you know, Pac-Man's a nice example to, to use. So again, maybe spend 10, 20 minutes doing this yourself. Start off looking at object selection. So what objects do we have within Pac-Man? What types of things are we going to have to write and create? Think about how they're linked. Where do they live? Are there any inheritance hierarchies within this that makes sense? What about data structures? What type of data structure should we have for storing these entities within? Um, and again, I think I will do this in class, uh, so maybe sort of roughly 10 minutes or so for that process. Um, for the update process, a similar type of thing that given those objects, given that structures, what would you do in your update? What would you do in your draw? How are you going to pull this together? And again, I would say roughly 10 minutes for that. Worthwhile doing. I don't have any simple solution to this, so again, you'll have your own design, but that's the process to go through. So key takeaway here, the thing that we're doing, it, it is divide and conquer. Writing a game, even a simple game, it's a complex entity. There's lots of things going on, there's lots of different parts to it. It helps us immensely, particularly when working in teams, particularly when we want to get down to detail and coding this, to break it up, to divide and conquer, to split things into levels, into objects, uh, to get down, to think about what they do in more details, to think about interactions. And building up that sort of world view of your game, you're getting it down to that level where you can get to the point where you think, you know what, I can try writing this class, I can do this, I can write that class, I can try to give it these things, I can load in these images. And then once you've got two classes, you can think, right, I can try to get these things talking together. So it's all about devolving it down to a level where you can start coding it and bringing the game uh, then to life. So it's going to be important that all teams engage in this process and spend quite a lot of time doing this progress because it is very much a dividend that the more time you spend here, the easier it will be and the quicker it will be then to implement and to write uh, your game overall.